Good morning. I'm Roger Wasson. We're glad to have people joining us today for a conversation. And the conversation that we're going to have today is actually a continuation of a conversation that the U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Association got started. And on September 22nd, there was a food dialogues. And we had people, including this morning's guests, that were involved in panel presentations. And at that time, we were getting questions. We got a lot of questions came up and questions that were coming to us from on Facebook and Twitter, and we didn't have a chance to get them all answered. Uh, we promised the people that we were going to come back, and we have. And that's what we're going to do today. We've gone through the feedback that we got from you, that we got on Facebook and on Twitter and on emails, and we've narrowed them down to we've got 19 questions. We're going to get as many of them covered as we can, but these are directly questions that were coming as a result of that discussion and questions, and the questions particularly for today deal with biotech and what does that mean? And then with that, uh, GMOs and genetic engineering, there's confusion. And then beyond that particular confusion, there's just, again, lots of questions. So from our original panel, uh, we've got with us th today uh, Dr. Pam Ronald and, uh, and Michael Dimmick. And Michael is president of Roots' Change. And Pam is the author of a book. I'll have you explain your book a little bit more. And also is on campus here at UC Davis. I'd have to say that the two of you uh, probably generated more questions online than almost anybody else we had. And we had comments along the lines of, well, you know what? Uh, Dr. Ronald's raising some really interesting points. And the same thing about you, Michael. They're saying, well, that's an interesting point. It's a different way of looking at it. And it seems that one of the things we are trying to establish is to have that conversation. And so coming at it the way you do on these subjects, we're looking forward to getting into that. But before we go any further, Pam, why don't we start with you and get us a little bit more introduction of, of who you are, what you're doing here at the campus, and maybe a, a word or two about your book, too. So I'm a professor here at UC Davis, and I study the role genes play in the response to the environment. So in particular, we're interested in understanding the genetic basis of uh, tolerance to environmental stress or resistance to disease. And most of my work is uh, of particular interest to people in the developing world because I work on rice, which is the staple food for half the world's people. So because I'm a geneticist uh, and my husband's an organic farmer, we have Many of our friends and families have asked us about the role of genetics in agriculture and the questions about whether we can just convert all land to organic farming to feed the world and whether or not genetically engineered crops are safe to eat. So in response to those questions, Raul and I wrote um, this book, Tomorrow's Table, Organic Farming Genetics and the Future of Food. And what we try to do in the book is bring the reader into the lives of a geneticist and organic farmer so uh, the reader can understand the kinds of uh, practices that we carry out. And also, we focus on sustainability. The book is really about sustainable agriculture. What are the key questions for sustainable agriculture and how can we uh, uh, face those challenges? And we... Uh, talk about that in detail in the book and I think a lot of that will come up today so yeah, good thanks Michael Thank you've you. come at this a little differently I mean you've actually been a farmer you've been involved in a lot of segments of agriculture and now you're president of Roots of Change uh, so well I, I think I'll start with the fact that Roots of Change is uh, based in California focused on building the sustainable food movement or the, uh, the, the transition to a sustainable food system in the state of California because we see it as a, a major leverage point for change nationally and internationally. Um, and we have 60,000 people in the state of California who follow us online and uh, respond to our calls for action around policy or markets. And uh, we have a, a deep uh, belief that um, if you don't develop a sustainable food system, you can't in fact have a sustainable civilization because the food system is the basis of civilization. So it's very important that as a planet, as a nation, as a state, uh, we actually um, learn how to uh, produce food um, and feed people without destroying the environment and uh, the social systems upon which uh, uh, peace is based. So. Yeah. Pretty ambitious conversation right there. Yeah. 
Well, we're glad you take, took some time this morning, and we're going to plunge right in, get into the questions. I want to remind people that they're able to uh, post comments. We're going to be looking at what they what comes in on on Facebook, uh, and also uh, our hashtag Food D on Twitter. And so we're we're anxious to keep getting feedback as we continue this morning's conversation. But again, I, I want to emphasize that what we're working from this list are questions that are coming that came to us earlier. And so we're going to take the questions, and you both can respond to them and make comments on them, and we'll start working our way through. Um, the first question, really, is uh, uh, you know, as we start plunging into this, uh, how, do we, how do we talk about biotech? I mean, we talk biotech, uh, GMO, genetic engineering. Uh, you know, it's confusing to some people, I think. Uh, Pam, how, how do you usually explain it? I tend to use the phrase genetically engineered crops rather than GMO. Uh, the reason is that uh, genetic engineering is a precise um, uh, procedure that has been developed over the last 30 years, and it involves taking a gene from uh, the same species or a similar species or a completely different species and introducing that gene into a crop plant. And there's a couple different ways you can introduce the gene. And you end up with a new variety that has one to two to maybe three genes uh, that are different. And uh, conventional breeding uses, uh, conventional breeding actually spans a whole huge list of different processes. So mm -hmm. uh, there's the classical pollination approach, but there's also things like random mutagenesis, where you soak seeds in a carcinogenic solution and sort out the interesting traits. There's um, things like um, embryo rescue, where you take two different species and you can rescue the embryo in a test tube. So all those types of procedures are called conventional breeding procedures. And um, the reason I don't like to use GMO is because Everything we eat is genetically modified in some way. Mm -hmm. So nothing we eat, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, is ever found um, seeds in nature and then planted um, and then grown from that. So everything has been developed through different types of genetic techniques. And I think the, the key question for the public is genetic engineering. They want to know about uh, what are the possible benefits or drawbacks to this procedure of genetic engineering because what is very different is you can take a gene from any species and put it into uh, a crop plant. You're nodding, Michael. Yeah, I think that's the, the main point that um, begins the, the moral, ethical, economic, and social debate around uh, these organisms is that you're introducing um, genes in a way that in the natural world does not occur. So. Um, the consequences of that, particularly social and economic, become very important, but also uh, environmentally. Um, and I think we'll get into uh, the consequences of that new form of creating new crops, because it is a new form, and it's a form that's really been developed in the last 30 years. I first came across it in 1985 mm -hmm. when I was studying Russian, and my tutor was a Russian immigre at the University of Santa Cruz who was working on uh, allowing plants to better take up nitrogen at UC Santa Cruz. Early research on the topic, and that's when mm -hmm. I first heard about it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and the excitement for him was that human beings were now in, inserting genes in a way that nature would never do. And I think that's a really important thing for us to think about. Not because it's good or bad, but because there are huge consequences or implications of human beings having that power um, and that ability. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe I'll just continue. I think it does bring up very interesting questions, which is why we're here today, very legitimate questions that need to be addressed. However, as a scientist and a plant geneticist and um, a breeder, we, we tend not to say um, genetic engineering is different because it would not occur in the natural world. It would not occur in the natural world, you're right, but neither would anything else that we eat. So, for example, hybrids are two very different um, distinctly different uh, genetic profiles that have been developed over many years, and then they're crossed. And these two different genetic profiles are as different as a, from a, a chimp versus a human. Mm -hmm. They're even more different. And so we're making those crosses, and we're creating hybrids that 
um, are sold to the farmer, and the farmer does not then collect the seed and plant them out because they don't get the same traits in the next generation. Right. So hybrids also would not have been found in the natural world. Right. And so that's something, again, where I'll bring it up several times in the conversation, that the question of being specific. And, and right. uh, we talked about this earlier. I think we can advance the dialogue when we're very specific about the issues of sustainability. Right. And I completely agree with Michael. There are so many important issues. We have 7 billion people on the planet this week. And um, we have to live in a more sustainable manner. We have to farm more sustainabil uh, sustainably. Yeah. And there are key questions, really. So how can we use less land, less water, yeah. um, reduce fertilizer waste, uh, get rid of the most toxic pesticides? They're not all toxic. I mean, organic yeah. farmers right. use some pesticides right. as well. Get rid of right. the most toxic and really um, have an integrated uh, management approach that benefits um, as many people as possible. And, and those are the key questions. And then we could talk about specific farming practices and specific breeding practices that will advance those goals. Well, these key questions, I mean, here is a key question that, that I think we've got several that build on what you both have said so far. Um, uh, one question is, are certified organic farmers allowed to use GMO seed? No. The uh, USDA National Organic Program Standards um, does not allow organic farmers to plant genetically engineered seed. So, so, so if somebody's buying organic, then that's, you know, that it's not it's not uh, GMO. Is there's not genetic engineered? Well, it. I would say that that the the goal uh, the goal of gene of of organic certification is to ensure that um, food does not contain genetically engineered. Um, components or genes. The, the, the risk um, is that, in fact, organic can be contaminated through um, the cross, through wind or other means of a genetically modified gene getting into, or a set of genes getting into another species, or an organic species, or an organic crop. There's some, there's some real concerns about that, and um, that, so the question becomes, who who is responsible for those kinds of uh, um, adulterations of organically certified crops? Uh, who who bears the risk? Who is going to pay for the implications to the organic farmer? I think that's one of the huge issues that's on the table, and that's why I said earlier, you know, there are social huge social and economic mm -hmm. impacts as a result of genetic engineering uh, or genetically modified crops. So. Um, I think it's an important thing for us to talk about because right now um, there are political leaders and uh, I would call food industry leaders who are calling for um, you know the the coexistence of organic and and modified crops and I think that's a that's an important question to really delve deeply into because I'm not sure that that's possible and many organic farmers are not sure that's possible. Pam, is it possible? Uh, I mean, you've done work specifically in rice, and so I'm, I would imagine that's a question in that industry as well. As you've as you've worked in the in the rice industry, uh, do you take into account the risk of of contamination in your in your research? So it's um, very important that organic farmers have access to their markets and that they can continue to thrive as an industry. So these are very important questions and. Um, there's a, a couple things that are also, I think, important to consider. So organic farmers are allowed to use seed that's been mutagenized. So this is random mutagenesis, um, as I mentioned before, um, soaking in um, uh, carcinogenic uh, compounds and then, then looking at the different traits. So, so when you eat the food, you're not going to get cancer because this is a generation before. It's perfectly safe. But the National Research Council has uh, indicated that this random mutagenesis introduces more changes than you get with genetic engineering. So just to put it in perspective in terms of the types of risk, um, mm -hmm. and the National Research Council in the United States, as well as in all countries um, in the world, the scientists have um, v said very clearly that the process of genetic engineering is no more risky than the process of conventional breeding. So uh, that's important to keep in mind as well. Now, 
There are different perspectives on that, though. Okay. There are people that believe that, in fact, there are risks associated with genetic engineering that would not be found in other forms of, of, of breeding, so to speak, or crossing of genes. <clears throat> As I said to you before this began, I'm not a scientist, so I'm not going to debate with you about that. I'm just saying, yeah. I'm just trying to put a, a point on the on the table that, in fact, there are people that have different viewpoints of that. And so I don't think it's completely, there's not consensus. And as we know in science, it's very hard to reach full consensus. It's, it's We have to go with great majorities of consensus, like around climate change. Um, but, you know, I, I do believe that there are elements of the public and some scientists who are in agreement with the 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 fact that one type of breeding s system is uh, necessarily you know safer than the other, but I think the more important point around all this, because you weren't really getting to the question, is what are we going to do about organic farmers who who uh, experience contamination because of this? Yeah, no, I'd like to get to that. Okay. I I tend to maybe okay. go on too much. So so to get to your point that there certainly are people that believe that somehow genetic engineering is more risky, but these are not science-based beliefs. You can always find a scientist that will um, perhaps not believe in global climate change or doesn't think that vaccines, using vaccines mm -hmm. outweighs the benefits. Right. There's mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. always going to be a public discussion, but when mm -hmm. you look at science-based arguments, those arguments are very clear and there is quite a consensus mm -hmm. that the introduction of a gene through genetic engineering is no more risky than introduction through conventional breeding. That's mm -hmm. not to say that that's the end of the story. Somebody mm -hmm. might have philosophical right. reasons for not accepting it. Um, and so then in terms of pollen flow, so when the organic uh, certification was established, they did they, some things very carefully. So, for example, they knew that organic crops were going to coexist with conventional crops that were the farmer's spray pesticides. So in California we grow 350 different types of crops in different farming systems. So um, what was specified is that uh, less than 5 percent of uh, uh, the EPA allowable pesticide residue can spray onto mm -hmm. the field. The, the organic farmer is doing their best to not um, use their own um, mm -hmm particular types of pesticides. They're allowed to use some, but there's some they're not allowed to use. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is very clear in the organic regulations. So to date, there has not been an organic farmer decertified because of pollen flow. But it is true, it's not in the regulations. Like pesticide flow is really spelled out, less than 5%. Um, and so there... So it's a gray area. Yeah. Well. It's not a gray area in the sense that the USDA has even issued a letter saying they're not going to decertify people oh, okay. if there's a pollen flow. However, you know, it could be that the public says, well, I heard that there's, you had 0.1% of a, of a trans gene that comes into your farm, so I don't want to buy it. And those are important market considerations that are, are very important to the organic farmer. Also, uh, you know, farmers, uh, I mean, we haven't got into this yet, but mm -hmm. I think it's one of, it's for me, the key issue underlying this whole problem, uh, which has to do with concentration of power and wealth in the food system. Um, there are farmers who have been sued by different companies for gene flow, basically, you know, contamination, right? Farmers have been sued because um, there was a gene from a genetically modified crop that got into a non-genetically modified crop. And I'm not talking about organic here necessarily, but I'm talking about gene flow and then farmers getting sued. And that, that really brings up the whole question because I think there's different realms here. There's the scientific research, folks like you, good people mm -hmm. doing research to understand how genes can be used, um, uh, gene, genetic engineering can be used to create crops that could be useful in some way. Um, we can talk about that, but then there's a, there's a whole other realm, which is the commercialization of these crops and what the implications of that are. Some have to do with market loss if there's gene flow. Some have to do with being sued um, if there's gene flow. So it gets really complex really quickly, and um, those issues are the ones that I think we really need to explore because in the end, that's where the resistance comes from the public. You know, we know 90% when people ask, 90% of people say, I'd like to know if I'm buying a genetically modified crop or food. Why? Because people want to understand what they're ingesting. And this, mm -hmm. this is really important um, going forward. If, if as many people in, in your field or in, in, in food um, industry want genetically modified crops to be part of the marketplace, there's going to have to be a lot more um, in-depth explanation and answering of concerns regarding those, the issues that I'm bringing up here. 
Let's get the, well. Let's yeah. get back to the question. No, I then. mean, I, I agree, I, and I think it's good that we have. Yeah. Well, I'm I, thinking I, too when we start talking about this, uh, and and I imagine people that are watching us, you know, it's it does start getting confusing. Yeah. I mean, you know, you you add, uh, you want a great big whiteboard. I do. Some some people probably like to visually uh, see these things, and and I'm thinking I want to start drawing lines here because you're bringing several different key points up in this whole conversation, and. And our next question uh, kind of advances. It, it wraps itself around. The, could, could I answer okay, this okay, one go ahead. just one yeah. more time? So I, I want to just um, emphasize again, and this will come up later, is okay. that the genetically engineered crops that are on the market now are safe for the environment and safe um, for human health. And for science-based reasoning, and that has every academic society around the world that has looked at this issue has said that it does has said that it doesn't mean that everything in the future will necessarily necessarily be safe to eat for the safe for the environment but that's to say if pollen flows which it does for pollen does flow it's harmless it's benign not in terms of markets so markets is another issue that we have to talk about but also, what about creating what about creating resistance to BT, for instance, or weeds that become more and more res resistant to herbicides because we have basically intensified um, the gene flow so that there's adaptation very quickly. I mean, this gets very complex for an audience who doesn't know about yeah. these issues, but I mean, those are real issues, and though I would say there is danger in that. There's danger to farmers. There's danger to ecosystems. Would you not agree with that? I would, um, That's interesting. so the, yeah, the National Research Council's put out a, a report, Environmental Effects of Transgenes, and they make the same um, statement that conventional breeding and genetically engineered crops do not pose increased risk. But what you bring up about herbicide resistance, we know that if you spray a lot of, an herb, of a single herbicide, eventually weeds will develop resistance. Right. That's absolutely true, but it's the herbicide. So we could ban the herbicide, we can ban all herbicides, but that's not something that's even in the discussion. It doesn't actually have to do with the process of genetic engineering. Mm -hmm. um, and the other well, It has to do with the consequences of genetic engineering, though. It, yeah, it has to do, because this herbicide that people are spraying is much less toxic than what's been used before, farmers love it because it's safer for farm workers, it's highly effective, it's better for the environment. So farmers in some regions of the United States, they've used so much of it and they're not rotating their crops. So right. this is the point we make in our book, uh, we try to make again and again, is that genetically engineered seed is in a sense no better than other seed. It's the management practices that are also important. Right. You need to have an integrated pest management approach so you don't develop these types of resistances. Right. Yeah. Well, this next question, though, is to, uh, it really kind of continues the same line. So what is the relationship between organic genetics and sustainability? And continuing on that, uh, can genetic modification uh, be both sustainable and organic? Again, this is a verbatim question. Can, can, uh, can, can genetic modification be both sustainable and Organic. Well, we've already yeah. agreed, I think we've already agreed that traditional plant breeding is a form of genetic modification, right? Right. Okay, so the question doesn't really get to the point uh, of the issues here. Um, uh, you know, we, uh, traditional plant breeding modifies crops. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, um, mm -hmm. they, they can, but the issue of sustainability has three big legs, right? It has economic sustainability, environmental sustainability, and social sustainability. When you start talking about genetically modified organisms and the current regime for introducing commercial crops, the issues of economics and social um, and environmental, I would argue, uh, 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 sustainability become issues. Um, <clears throat> because, as was just said, Pam described, I, and I really appreciate her saying it, um, these, the, cro the crops, 80% of basically, 80% of the crops that are now genetically modified that are used mm -hmm. are around... Um, the availability or, or the ability to use more pesticide or herbicide in the fields um, to control pests, basically, herbs, uh, you know, plants or, or, or bugs. And what that, and those systems are used in basically monocultures. And the monocultures are what you're getting to. Monoculture is probably not sustainable in almost any realm. I mean, you have to rotate crops. You have to have diversity in a system to keep it healthy. These 
current generation of, of GMO crops really support um, monocropping. That's really what they're designed to do. Would you not agree? And so that creates real issues around the future sustainability. Okay, so, so I would say that monoculture began long before genetic engineering ever came into the picture. And so the issues that you work on are so important that we need to get an integrated system. Mm -hmm. I don't think that genetic engineering is increasing monoculture. I think those big cornfields um, were there. They were there before we had genetic engineering. Genetic engineering is actually bringing diversity back into the crops because you're bringing in genes that had not been looked at before. And I, I, again, I, I think it's good to go to specifics. So let's okay. take two examples and let's look at them in um, light of sustainable agriculture. And they're very different. So there's cotton, BT cotton, let's mm -hmm. look at that. And that has been put out by a large corporation planted all over the world now. And there's papaya, so a nonprofit funded project developed by a local Hawaiian for small growers. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that both those have advanced sustainability tremendously. And I'll, te I'll tell you why. So let's just take cotton in Arizona. What's wonderful about the cotton program in Arizona is we have ecologists, entomologists, breeders, farmers and the government working together to have an integrated pest management system. Mm -hmm. And in that situation, the amount of insecticides has been reduced in half compared, compared to conventional systems. And the reason that's important is that cotton uses something like 25% of the world's insecticide. Half of those are considered carcinogenic or potentially carcinogenic. So if we can reduce the amount of insecticides, it benefits everybody. It benefits the, the biodiversity in the field because um, there are more insects in a more diverse mm -hmm. uh, species of insects mm -hmm. in a GE cotton field versus a conventional field. Mm -hmm. And what the Arizona group did is very important is they mandated a crop diversity strategy. They didn't mm -hmm. just say, here's a new seed plant it, it's going to solve all your solutions. Mm -hmm. They mandated that there had to be um, area, areas where um, non-BT crops mm -hmm. were grown. Mm -hmm. And it's working very well. Mm -hmm. In Arizona, there hasn't been evolution of resistance mm -hmm. of insects. And we've seen that even sprayed BT, organic farmers use spray BT. Mm -hmm. And sprayed BT has led to the evolution of resistant insects because whether you spray it in an organic approach or put it in the crop, right. there's always the risk of evolving resistance. And so in either system, you have to have this integrated management. Rate of resistance, would you, would you agree that the rate of resistance um, through uh, the insertion of the BT gene into crops um, will speed up that, uh, the resistance because it's more, uh, uh, more prevalent? So that was the, the question 15 years ago, a very important and valid question because mm -hmm. we've known from 100 years of spraying pesticides, if you spray a lot of it, you're going to get resistance. Mm -hmm. But the research is so clear um, now, again, just looking at cotton in Arizona, it's still incredibly effective. There are not resistant insects in Arizona. I'm not really talking Arizona. about cotton. I'm, what you're talking yeah. about, that's, I, 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 I'm, I'm listening to you and I'm saying, wow, that's very cool. I'm glad that there's this kind of an experiment, that integrated approach. What I'm talking about is the massive use around the world, particularly I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about corn, and uh, because organic farmers who use BT to grow you know, corn and other crops are concerned about its use as an inserted gene because of the resistance that they feel could be lost for them. It's, it's definitely a concern, but that's where our government did something very good. They mandated a crop diversity strategy. And you can see in, Arizona. in the entire United States and even in there's a paper in Science Magazine last year looking mm -hmm. specifically at BT corn mm -hmm. in the Midwest. And they mm -hmm. found billions of dollars of benefits to the growers that are growing BT corn because mm -hmm. they're not spraying insecticide. Their farm workers are safer. They also see benefits to growers in the area that are not growing BT corn. And the reason is that the insect population has gone down. 
Mm -hmm. um, and so I bring up Science Magazine because there have been 15 years of peer-reviewed studies that often aren't getting out into the public. Mm -hmm. um, and I have, I'll put them all on my blog again so people can actually look at them and read them because these are really important questions, um, incredibly important. But after 15 years, we have some answers. And we also know in places of the world where they're not manda mandating crop diversity strategy, we are getting resistant to insects. You know, when you talk about diversity, I just have to add one thing, because we're in California, mm -hmm. and we are talking corn and soybeans, cotton, and a lot of other, uh, other products. But here we've got over 250 commodities. And one trend we have here is towards monoculture in that trees and vines. And we now have over half of our acreage you know, our almonds or pistachios and walnuts and grapes and, and uh, olive trees now. And in the case of the pistachios we're planting, they're, um, you know, they're going to be in the ground over 100 years. Mm -hmm. And so you, you don't rotate them all. I, I guess the only thing I'm saying is mm -hmm. that when we do talk about agriculture it's, and when we start talking about monoculture, there's, there's such a variation with all of these different, different products. Um, um, That's true. Yeah, That's I, I think. Point. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're, what, we're, what, what we're saying is, it doesn't matter if it's organic or or conventional or GM, GM crops. Um, there has to be diversity in the system. Um, the other issue that we, we still haven't gotten to is the issue, issue of ownership of of these um, these organisms. Uh, I think that it's important for us to acknowledge the concern. I mean. We talked about this, I think, in the past. This whole thing that's going on with Occupy Wall Street is a reaction to concentration of wealth and power. Um, people don't believe that the Congress is responsive anymore. They believe that the, the Congress really listens to those who vote every day with their dollars versus Americans who vote every two years in an election. And I think that people are worried about the concentration of wealth in the banks and in the financial sector. Well, genetically modified crops as currently uh, introduced into the marketplace are another manifestation of that concentration. You've got companies who change one, two, or three genes, as you described, in a life form that has existed for perhaps billions of years through evolution, millions and billions of years through evolution. They come and they change three, three genes in a, in, a, in a species and then claim ownership over that species. To me, there, there's a real moral ethical issue, kind of a ripping off of the commons in that. And I think that that's an issue that underlies a lot of concern from folks in my world about how this technology is being introduced and commercialized and, and basically benefited from. Because in the end, the question is who benefits here? Um, I was in a meeting last week with a group of conventional farmers from up and down the state, leaders. And one of them said, I can't believe what this company has done to us because of the way they've handled genetically modified crops. They're really pissed off because the Corporations are being served, but the farmers are not being served. The farmers are under attack. Their markets are at risk. People are confused. And so this whole issue of ownership has to be dealt with. I'm, as a yeah. scientist, you're in a different world. But I'm very curious about how you feel about what's happening for you in your field of study, given this backdrop that I'm well, talking about. Well, let me add something to his question, yeah. uh, Pam. Maybe you could... Uh, I think the whole question of intellectual property. I mean, you actually... I believe the university even has patents on genetics that are conventional um, uh, genetics. Hybrids. Yeah, hybrids. I mean, in some of the departments, too. So actually, the laws even for intellectual properties in this area are, are fairly new, aren't they? Were they 20 years? or? So um, any large corporate seed company is going to want to own everything. And I yeah. think that is something that we need to be concerned about. We don't want all the valuable seeds um, controlled by just a handful of companies. I think that is a problem. But it's a problem whether it's genetically engineered or not genetically I engineered do. because these companies can patent, um, uh, they can't patent the whole species, but they can patent the variety mm -hmm. whether or not it's genetically engineered. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think something that's not perhaps understood, even organic farmers Right. Buy seed, and right. they buy seed from corporations. They're probably buying from Monsanto because mm -hmm. Monsanto owns so many seed companies, mm -hmm. and the organic farmers maybe is buying from Johnny's Seed, but mm -hmm. those seeds are coming from Monsanto. Those are patented. Well, we're not going to yeah. be getting any specific companies. We're talking about oh, the Oh, I'm general sorry. Yeah, we yeah. don't mean to slam any companies, yeah, but right. it's, it is true that, um, that there is definitely a, a profit motive 
We can argue whether that's bad or good. I think as, a, as an American, as we don't want to see monopolies. But those are issues for the Justice Department to look at. They're not issues of science and genetic engineering, oh, I would well, argue. Okay, they're not, sci they're not questions of science and genetic engineering necessarily. But scientists, I think through history, mm -hmm. have, have been huge voices in moral debates. Um, and I think that is an important thing for us to, because scientists understand things at certain levels and um, you know, I think it's important for them to weigh in on this because they're being affected. Your ability to do research is being affected. And I think my, the people that I represent and work with are very interested in research. They think the research is fabulous because there are important things that could be discovered and utilized. It gets all messed up when we get into this issue of who owns it and how it's used and who benefits. And um, that's a really important point for us all to consider because if we dealt with that, and I think there was a recent article, it might even been you or one of the authors that came out of UC Davis about, um, uh, was it salmon, the whole salmon debate, um, uh, about genetically engineered salmon entering the marketplace? That was probably Allison. Yes, okay, ben there was Newman. huge debate around that. And they argued, oh, scientifically, you know, and I read the article, like, oh, scientifically, there's no problem here, da, da, da. But they were avoiding the whole point about who owns it and how consumers feel about it, which is really the basis of our problems here. I mean, people don't trust. And the question is, why do they not trust? And what are we doing? You as a scientist, me as an activist, you mm -hmm. as someone who works with industry, what are we doing to lower the, the fears that exist out there and work with people's fear and legitimate concern? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think we're having this conversation. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I think the thing is that sitting together and you're beginning to actually put these yeah. on the table rather than being in our separate separate meetings and not being at the same yeah. table and saying this is coming up. Right. And, and, and But let me, let me flip it from one of our questions and get back on track with one of our questions because... You really want to stand to these questions? I do, I do. Yeah, we told everybody we were going to ask the question. And we knew this was going to be it. That you both yeah. had so many but things to get But we are getting to the issues in the questions. You're covering an awful lot of them. I'm answer but, question. It's a good question. <laughs> well, I think... I, well, maybe it'll come here. Okay. Let me try this one, though, first. So first of all, this question is, uh, but, but aren't we with biotech helping people that are dealing with food insecurity worldwide? Uh, and I think connected to that, and if that is affirmative, that there is some help with dealing with uh, food security worldwide, shouldn't we consider the ethics of not using genetics when its use enables a safe and more environmentally sustainable production system. Well, there's no. a very interesting assumption in that question. Yeah. Because that, is, that question assumes that biotech is the only way to provide nutritionally healthy food. I mean, I was just looking this morning in preparation for this, and all the reports that have come out in the last year are saying that agroecology and organic systems can feed the world. So there's a big debate around that. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times people say we need biotechnology because we can't feed the world without it. Well, is that true? Is that actually true? I don't think anyone in this room can actually answer that question because we don't have enough science on it. Oh, I can answer the question. Well, you oh, have right. <laughs> That's well, what I'm here for, to answer we're, questions. We're lucky. No, no, no. I would answer it in a, okay. a science-based manner. Okay? So we know that genetic improvement has been critical to agricultural Productivity and sustainability. You um, through conventional breeding, you introduce a disease resistance right. gene, then you don't have to spray right. for that right. pest. We that. Right. And we know that there are increasing problems with overuse of certain pesticides. Right. We have more droughts. We're predicted to right. have more floods. Right. We also know that there is a genetic basis for tolerance for all these things. Mm -hmm. So there is no question in any scientist's minds that genetics will advance all these um, genetics, I genetics agree. in general right. and sometimes totally genetic engineering. Sometimes it'll be genetic engineering, sometimes not. Yes. But why close one of the most powerful tools that has um, reached agriculture ever? Well, okay, let that's start, a, uh, no, let me build off this because okay. Okay. <laughs> I want to build off this because I, yeah. I think you framed it in a very a, a fair way there. What you just said is why would you not use genetic engineering as part of this genetic modification approach to ensure that we can produce food into the future for a growing, rapidly growing world? Okay, true. Now, the big question is though, genetic engineering introduced in what ways? I just brought up a whole kind of complex of problems about how genetically engineered crops are owned and utilized and introduced into the marketplace. So as an advocate of sustainability, and as an advocate of social change, what I would argue is, okay, let's, let's keep the idea of genetic uh, engineered crops on the table, 
But let's agree that we need to deal with this other complex of ownership and power before we do that, because that problem right there is so huge, and the, manif the, the implications of it are so gargantuan. We have a history of people taking power over other people. That's history. We all know that. This country was based on people coming here to escape that kind of dominance. If we don't deal with this huge issue of ownership and power, we're never going to get to that other question without a huge fight. Well, well can I sure, say that? But, but I think we also agreed that, I agree, there's issues of ownership and power. Go occupy Wall Street. You know, I am, I love to see all this. Stuff. Okay? That wasn't but, in the question. Uh, okay. yeah. But we also agreed that um, large seed companies can, they want to own any kind of seed. It doesn't matter if it's genetic engineering. So yes. what I'm arguing is that this is indeed a big question, but why pile all the concerns about industrial agriculture and corporate ownership on genetic engineering, which is such an important tool? I see, I hear you guys being awfully close. I mean, I, I think that that if yeah, you were sitting right here, it, I know <laughs> you're sitting you're sitting close, but you were actually building on each other. As Pam was making this answer, you were nodding agreement with mm -hmm. her and accepting, you know, okay, well, genetic engineering may fit in all this. There's questions, and you raise another tier. There's going ahead. You see um, social issues and economic issues right. and, and questions, and you're not denying that either. You're saying from a scientist, you're, you know, that those. Those are those are important questions. They are. But and I, uh, uh, the I thing think I want to draw positive to, models. I do too. And well, I was just going to say the optim optimist in me likes to see that there were a couple of these things where there there there's agreement. You can say fine if or yeah, uh, yeah yes but. I, but I, I think that is there is some areas of common agreement. So Howard Yana Shapiro, I'm in this other meeting here today. Yeah. You know. So Howard Yana Shapiro for the Ag Sustainability Institute, chairman of the board of uh, the advisory board. Um, uh, is done something very interesting with the Mars Corporation. So they did the genetic sequencing of coca, mm -hmm. and they made that, uh, protected it, and put it in the public domain as a way to begin. So there's a use of genetic engineering, or uh, genetic research, yeah. um, that I think is very positive because, um, first of all, it's protected um, for public domain, and it becomes the basis for a huge amount of interesting things that they're trying to understand about how to make coca more sustainable and more economical and, and more healthy as a plant in, a, you know, in, in the world. So I think that's an interesting model for us to look, about, uh, look at and talk about. Um, um, uh, and it's, it's, it's a jump off point for going to a, a new place. But um, I, I think it, we can't overemphasize um, how big this resistance is and how big it's going to become because right now we know you know, there's all these movements to label everything. Yeah. So Wait, the, the, national the, and local. Well, could I just get back to about, yeah. so I think that um, one reason we agree more than we disagree is because we're looking at the issues of sustainability. We're not bogged down in sort of these ideological obsessions. We're looking at what can advance sustainability. And that's what Raul and I try to do in our book as well. We don't talk about whether genetic engineering is good or bad, whether profit is good or bad, or sort of these general things. We, we try to get specific and look at the big issues. And I completely agree, this open access to genetic information is very important. And it has been blossoming. There's many open right. access journals. Right. So in the past, anybody can get the peer-reviewed scientific information, but you often had to have a journal subscription. Right. And that limited access to people in less developed countries because maybe they can't afford a journal subscription. Now, scientists are increasingly going with this open access option. You don't even have to be associated with the university. You go, you get the information. And the, the amount, let me just give you an example of, of genetics, how it's changed. So in 2001, the first plant genome was sequenced for a cost of about um, $70 million. Ten okay? years ago. Ten years ago. Next year, the same project is expected to cost $99, take about two or three minutes. Mm -hmm. It's not a single genome. It's many genomes. Something like 22 plant genomes are being sequenced. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, all in the public domain. Anybody can look at that information. Mm -hmm. And what that means is we have more opportunities for genetic improvement than we've ever had before. Not only genetic engineering. There's other types of, of genetic techniques that people are using. And it's such a, it, it's such a renaissance and exciting time in genetics right now. And you asked what we would advocate. I advocate public funding for research. I agree. That's a point where we agree. Put it's got to be. Yeah, yeah. it's got to be. Uh, I, I would totally agree. What's happened is, 
a lot of distrust of science. Tom Tomich and I uh, from the Existing Buildings talk about this a lot, that science, whether it began in climate, well, it probably began before that, probably in nuclear energy, but um, in climate debate and in this debate around GMOs, scientists have been marginalized. People don't believe anymore because a lot of it has to do with who is funding the research and who is benefiting. So scientists are caught in this problem of being not believed because the public is so distrustful. So I'm very, I think that's great. Yeah. It would be great for all the university professors here at Davis to say, okay, this is who's funding me. And, and what I'd like is more public money. I'd like money so that, that my ability to be an objectively believed scientist is not compromised by who's funding me. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna just say something very, I hope very clearly. Most scientists, most plant biologists in the United States are not funded by Monsanto, okay? okay. So all my funding is public money, it's mm -hmm. federal. Every single colleague that I talk to every day is funded by the federal government, nonprofit research. So this, there's this idea that we're funded by corporations. Some people probably are, but corporations fund often very applied projects. We do basic research that often have important repercussions for people in less developed countries. So that, I think, is a misperception in the public. UC Davis plant biologists, probably 90% of our funding comes from nonprofit foundations. And it's very important to, to maintain that nonprofit research because then we can look at things like orphan crops or, or small acreage crops that don't have a large uh, right. profit. And so papaya, I love the papaya example because this was a $60,000 grant from the U.S. Department of Agriculture to uh, tackle a devastating problem. So there's a viral disease of papaya that um, basically kills all the papaya. And there's a local Hawaiian that developed a genetic engineering technique to put a snippet of the viral um, nucleic acids into papaya. And the plants are completely resistant. They yield 20-fold more than any other production method. There's nothing you can spray. There's no organic approach to control this disease. And today, 90% of the papaya that we get here in California is genetically engineered. The papaya was funded nonprofit, given away to growers. It was a local um, solution to a big, big problem. And that sort of gets lost because people think, well, you know, I heard it's just corporations doing this work. It's not true. Well, you know, you know, well, you, they're not, they're, the, mm. the corporations, excuse yeah, me, sure. uh, the corporations are not doing the genetic research always. They're, they're funding lots of it, and then they're also leveraging that research to create crops that then they own and, and profit from, right? So, and I, I'm not against but, profit. We yeah. have to have profit. So the question is, what I was trying to get to is the objectivity of science and the ability for people to feel safe around what's being introduced into the food system. And there are concerns there about the relationship between private industry and the universities because public support for universities is evaporating and there's tons of research being paid for on there, the margins. No, I mean what I'm saying is that, that that so so yeah. how, so what you're saying is that Monsanto or, don't, or, or some company or actually a genetically yeah company. there's 15 companies 15 yeah. companies who knows but the point is that they are using what you're saying is that the the, the patents they're receiving um, on genetically modified organisms are not paid for by them. I'm saying that there are certainly um, genetic translations and applications that make it to the private sector, the commercial sector. Mm -hmm. A company uh, will not go forward unless there's a gene patent, unless they can protect their ownership. Right. Absolutely. Right. But, but what I'm also saying is that doesn't mean that when you have 99% of the scientists in the world who have said genetically engineered crops on the market are safe to eat now, that the corporations paid us to say that. So we are um, working in a nonprofit sector, publishing our research in peer-reviewed journals, and providing that information free to the public. I, I agree. Yeah. But okay. The problem is this. The public doesn't believe it. And that's they the don't step. know it, right? Well, they don't know it. They and can so just the question look. is, why don't they know it? Well, I think they this is one of the first time the it's time been said. They to I go think. to UC Davis and look and see where um, they can look at my webpage and 
I always, we always say who our funding sources are. Well, you know what? Yeah. Though, you can do that, but the public isn't probably all going to go to your website, no, although I think it's a yeah. very good website. Right. But I think the other thing is that you say, well, why do, don't people know that? Well, you know, you said it more clearly this morning than I've heard it before. Uh, that that your lab is not getting any funding from any of the seed companies. I mean, that was just very, very clear, explicitly stated what you just yeah. you just got done st stating, and and I don't think that that point has been made as as clearly. So then the question yeah. becomes, how does a does a private company get the results of that research and then become owners of a patent based on that research? Okay. Does does it get sold by the university? Maybe it's not you, but the university owns what you've done, right? It's not your ownership, it's the university's ownership. Well, it's the submergence tolerance gene that we isolated in this laboratory several years ago now. We put that gene in the public domain. So as soon as you publish it, it's open access to everybody. That gene has now been taken into breeding programs by this fantastic breeding team at the International Rice Research Institute. It's been incorporated into many different types of germplasm. And this year, a million farmers are growing that seed. And that single gene allows the farmer to yield fourfold more rice when the field is flooded. And that's just a simple example of how genetic research is advancing agriculture for the public good. It's not to say there's but you're not, not really also my question. You're telling but, a good story, which but, is great. But there's also but, corporate research. Okay. But I would argue, okay, so cotton, we just talked about cotton. That um, seed now is produced by Monsanto. I think there's some other seed companies that are producing it. They're making a lot of profit. Um, this is America, you know, we hope they make profit. We hope they pay their taxes. Then maybe some of the money will come back down right, right. to people that need it. Um, okay, so that is absolutely a for-profit patented product. Well, who does it benefit? I would argue that genetically engineered cotton in Arizona is benefiting everybody. It's benefiting the farmer. It's ben benefiting the ants and beetles in the field. It's benefiting organic farmers in the region that are subjected to less insecticides. So just because it's a for-profit product doesn't mean it's bad. Um. Well, it's interesting. I mean, there, see, this is what this is the limit of this kind. Of, I, I'm seeing we have ten minutes left, so oh. um, uh, you know, I, I, it's difficult because we could get into a whole conversation about, you know, it, in aggregate, are we actually using less pesticides? Because I, I see data uh, reports, um, people, spokespeople talking about the fact that in in places where resistance is growing uh, uh, <coughs> to you know, herbicide, they're using more and more of it. Um, so, so in fact, after a few years, are we using less? I mean, there, so there are some important questions around that, and, and I think it takes us off um, on that. And I, I can share these reports with you. So, people tend to merge herbicides and insecticides. Okay. That's why you have to be specific. I agree. There is nobody that will argue that we're using um, more insecticides since BT right. crop in. It's very well established that we're using massive reductions in insecticides, not only in Arizona, but in India, in China, well, let's all about over it, the what world. About, uh, what about in, in, in places in Canada and, and in uh, the United States, in the, in the great central part of the, the United States, where we've been using these crops for a long time and there's resistance problem and farmers are in fact not using them anymore. They're there's moving back to, back to uh, conventional, you know, hybridized crops because of because of the resistance are no, seeing that. No, no, BT corn is still, BT corn and cotton is still being used everywhere. I think, um, and this is a common thing we see in, well, in my class, corn, one of my there's, students there's is there. There's rapeseed, right. there's many different so, varietals. I mean, there are very many different crops that are, have been modified. I think so. you're talking about herbicides. Because what we are seeing is that we're using more Roundup in some places right, of the world. Uh, herbicides is different sorry. than insecticides. Yeah, I agree. Okay. And so, so that, again, it's important to be specific. Right, right. But the issue with herbicides is the overall toxicity of herbicides has reduced dramatically. It doesn't mean that we're not using herbicides anymore. Obviously, we are because the crops were genetically engineered to resist the herbicide. Right. But there are environmental, clear environmental benefits. But let's take a deep breath here for a second. Okay. You know, Let's I think our, our, our goal Thanks. plunging into this was to be able to start taking the, the conversation to another level. I think we have. We found several things that have been clarified this morning by both of you. That, And I think, and maybe for the first time together, uh, and I think we're going to have to continue. And I just want to remind people that may be watching us right now, too, 
that you can continue to keep this discussion going. I and mean, we encourage you to be able to go on and, and uh, you know, post messages on Facebook, raise your questions, and on Twitter, you know, we're at, at FoodD, hashtag FoodD. And so they can continue to post questions. We're going to keep looking at them. We're going to have something else like this. But let's switch gears because uh, there's another key issue that came up in the questions that I think we should be sure to bring up were questions that about the identification or labeling of, of GMOs or right. biotech product. And we have several. I'm not going to read each one of the specific questions, but we have several questions here. Uh, we've had people that have identified to us saying, gee, why does our government think that we're not able to make up our mind? Why do they assume that we think things are too scary, that we can't understand them? We have somebody saying, why is our, pol our policies different than they are they are in Europe. Now, I know this is going to be another one of those areas we're not going to get finished on, on time. But I think it's an important area that is uh, that there has been a lot of a lot of things coming up about the identification, about whether or not there needs to be uh, labels. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I talked to the Center for Food Safety yesterday, um, folks from there, which has done a lot of the groundbreaking work in the United States mm -hmm. around patent law, making you know lawsuits around genetically modified organisms. And uh, about this issue, and I brought up the difference between European and, and American policy around this. And, and I, I think it's important to note that in, in Europe, uh, there was a food culture there for a long time. And people, when the idea of genetically modified organisms or food became apparent, you know, they, they found from the public that 90% of the people wanted to, know, wanted to be able to have a choice. So they passed laws early on before all the big fights began. And, and so they have a different approach. In the United States now, there's this movement, both here in California and nationally and around uh, salmon, to, to, to make it clear to the public that they have a choice. And I think it's, you know, uh, you're going to say it, but I think a lot of people don't want to see labeling who work in the industry, either the food industry or genetic engineers, because they fear that the public's going to basically say no. And so it gets us back to this question of why are they saying no? What is the distrust about? And it... It, it, it drives home the point that I'm making that we need to deal with that issue. We need leadership in this country from the scientists, from the politicians, from the food industry, and from the activists working on what is that resistance about and, and to get to that issue because um, people do want the choice. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to know. They want Consumers want a choice. They want to be able to decide. So, so what I like to say is that in Europe and the United States, the scientists are in consensus that the genetically engineered crops on the market are safe to eat. The policymakers are never in consensus, but it's the same issues with climate change. There's scientific, absolute, well, okay, never say absolute, near absolute scientific consensus. There was just a 10 year study that cost. Safe to eat is not the well, only let me issue. I, I'm going to address all okay. this for sure. Okay. So there was uh, 300 million euros was just spent by the European Commission to look at the safety of genetically engineered crop. 500 different um, independent research groups and their conclusion that, again, the process of genetic engineering doesn't introduce more risks than other. Um, processes. So that's one thing. Um, and that's important because one of the issues with labeling is people think somehow it's not safe to eat. And there's no scientific evidence for that. But the other issue that, again, it gets back to the specificity. I love labeling, actually. But I want the label to be informative. I want to be able to see a papaya that says genetically engineered with a trace amount of virus versus or an organic papaya that would say massive amounts of viral RNA and DNA and protein. So that just gives you an example. If you grow a papaya in Hawaii, almost any system besides a genetically engineered farm, it's totally infected with the virus. Does it matter? Well, it matters to the grower because they get 20-fold less yield. Is there a human health effect? No. We can eat gobs of virus. It's harmless to humans. But that just shows you sort of the, the misunderstanding as to what... So to label a GMO papaya is almost nonsensical. You need to say trace amounts of a, a viral nucleic acid that immunizes the papaya to resistance, uh, immunizes the papaya against disease. So sort of... Um, and, and, I, and that is something... I'm opposed to GMO label because... It means nothing. As we talked about, most of the often the public doesn't even know that everything is genetically altered. Well, so why not put why not put um, you know 
This corn was genetically engineered with Bt, a common soil dwelling organism used by organic farmers. A little more information, and maybe it doesn't all fit, but maybe we can have barcodes so people could get that real information, completely open access is what I'd like to see, not just a marketing ploy, because we know as soon as it goes, no GMO, there'll be a lot of people that want to market no GMO as being safer for the environment and safer for human health, which is false. Well, I don't so know that's, if that's necessarily, you know, there might be some who would say that, but I think that all the issues mm -hmm. I'm trying to bring up would also be part of that. It's a complex of issues that that it, it's not that simple to say, um, you know, it's just about food safety or um, or or power or or money. I mean, they're all together, and so w we're talking about food. People have to take it in every day. They have a higher level of of, of trust that has to be um, proved in order for them to feel comfortable. With something. There's been so much debate around this issue, and I'm not disagreeing with you. I mean, I think. Deep information is important. The question is, what's the reality of the people doing that? Um, you know, are they going to? Those mm -hmm. some will actually, because we know we get emails from people all the time. Oh, you know, I know this about food. I know that about food. What does it really mean? You know, people are interested in their food, so there will be some people that will go into the question in depth and try and understand it. I think what we have to look at is why is there this drive? It's another mm -hmm. manifestation of distrust. Yeah, and that's so the, true. That, and so the question yeah. is, what are we going to do? So that's why I keep going back to this question. You know, because as a scientist, I totally, under, I mean, uh, you being a scientist, I'm hearing the passion, I'm seeing your interest and, and your belief, your true belief that you are onto solutions that are going to help the world. Okay, I'm not going to argue with that. What I'm going to argue with is the implications of all that and what the public's believing and perceiving and how are we going to deal with that true issue. I don't know that I even hear an argument there. I mean, I, in some respects, I hear Pam almost saying she. There, in some ways, there ought to be even more information to be able to get their questions answered. And so, I mean, I, maybe I'm just sitting here to decide. Well, Michael, it, you, uh, Pam, well, I, no, you're here. You're hearing the good thing, the, the positive thing. That's right. But here's the problem: we live in a system. We have a system where people don't even they don't trust the FDA. Scientists. I mean, that, that's an issue. Yeah. That's what we need to be thinking about. But you don't about. trust a scientist. You should never trust me. You trust the science-based information. You trust the peer review system. You trust the experimentation and the consensus. And that's something yes, I'd like to let's... say is that science is not a belief system. It's not an opinion system. It's not right. it's policy. Evidence. It's yeah. not business. Yeah. It's science-based information, and that is, as my job as a scientist, is to get the science-based information out to the public, and then let policymakers do something with that information. But if you don't get the science-based information out, how can In anybody theory, make I that agree. decision? I agree. That's beautiful. Right. You're right. The problem is, when you say we hand it to the policymakers, then the implications of our current system come into play. The Congress, the policymakers, are not really listening to the people. Lobbyists vote yeah. every day. Citizens vote every two years. There's an imbalance there. So there's distrust. People know it. That's what the Occupy is about. So we're in this dilemma. The food industry is in the dilemma. The science is in the dilemma. Activists are in the dilemma. And listen, I work with very intelligent people. And these intelligent people are, understand what you just talked about in terms of how science is supposed to work, but they're not convinced. And these are not... They're not convinced about that not there's a scientific system. No, they're convinced it's a scientific system. They're not convinced that the objectivity of science um, ha is, is uh, to be believed or the claims of objectivity of science. Because, you know, I, I'm just telling you, I'm not, I'm not saying I, I'm agreeing with them or not. Yeah. What I'm saying is every day I see people sending to me reports about why this GMO crop is bad on scientific reasons versus that one. You know, it reminds me a lot of what goes on in the, in the climate debate. There's this exactly. huge, well, it's this and the huge vaccine issue. debate, creationism. It's right. all the same. The 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 policymakers and and um, the belief systems. The belief system is different than the science-based evidence. And you have policymakers and uh, creationists that cherry pick some weird science, maybe from some obscure journal that is not the scientific consensus. And if there's one thing that I hope the audience gets is that there are plenty of places they can get science-based information. They can go to 
um, nonprofit groups. Um, American Society of Plant Biologists is 6,000 scientists in the public domain. They can go to, there's a great website that, I, that I'm part of, started by graduate students that were in my class, a genetics and society class called Biofortified. Yeah. Um, yeah. They can get this information. They can have a dialogue. Well, you yeah. know what? Let, let me let me jump in here for a second. We're going to have to do time. we're going yeah. we're going to yeah. do a wrap. But oh, are I want, we over time? No, no. We're <laughs> we're talking a little longer. <laughs> okay. Uh, but you know, a couple of quick things. I mean, I think it's great that you're kind of showing where people can go for more information because right now, I think when this is over, the Center for Food Safety. Too. Okay, they're all. You know, I think when this is over, you're going to end up having. Well, your group, Roots of Change. Go to Roots of Change. Well, they, they people will pick their favorite search engine. And, yeah. and what usually is the problem, though, is that they can find a, a hundred pages of information that supports whatever their existing point of view is uh, when you go on and do a search engine search. So looking at some of these, these institutions that are getting deeper into the research, there's a way forward. But there is one other thing I want as we're approaching a wrap. Um, and, and you're saying, and you're saying, too, we need to continue this conversation. And what are we going to do about it? because there are certain things you both agreed on today. And, and we have talked about moving forward. One thing I do have to kind of remind us of is the fact that we're having this conversation is that uh, farmers and ranchers agreed that there needs to be a conversation. And it's one that needs to include views that both of you are bringing in, which are uh, not often expressed in the same conversation. And we've done it today, and we intend to do it again. And I've mentioned earlier that we want people to tweet their comments, their questions, get on Facebook, mm -hmm. look at our website, uh, and, and stay plugged in because these kinds of conversations have to not accept it where we are. Michael, I heard you. We, don't have, we haven't solved it. We haven't solved it today. We, we weren't able on some of these issues to say, well, okay, that's all done. We can tie it up in a nice knot. But we did, I feel, kind of take, take it up another step, and we did get some good issues on the table. And I, I, I really appreciate both of you taking the time and, uh, and I welcome you just making, uh, making a summary comment. Ladies first. Well, it was a pleasure to debate Michael Dimmick, and I think that what they're doing for sustainability is fantastic. And I think if we keep the issues of sustainability in mind, put that above, don't get bogged down on whether the crop was genetically engineered or conventionally bred or hybrid or mutagenized, and think about the important issues of sustainability. I think that is what is going to advance the conversation. Um, I would say that, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure if it was a debate. I hope it wasn't a debate. I hope it was more of a dialogue, which means we're, we're seeking some deeper understanding around these issues. But I, my, my sense is that, um, uh, that, you know, there are lots of good scientists in this world who are, are doing genetic research, genetic engineering, because they have a, a goal of making the world a better place. Wonderful thing. Um, the big problem for all of us around genetic engineering is how it's getting applied and who's benefiting and how are the decisions about how that gets applied being made, who's part of that conversation, and what are the implications of it being widely introduced. And I think those are the issues that we have to focus on if we're going to make progress in this area. And I don't see the forum yet for getting that done. Um, and I'd like to see that forum develop. And I think the scientists have a responsibility to be involved in framing a situation where we can actually get to the issues that are very important so that the public can understand them. Um, because if we don't, we're, we're not going to move forward. Thank you both. We're going to find that thank forum. You, we're going to promote forums, and we're going to promote yeah. more discussions. I want to yeah, thank, thank you, you Great for letting thank us be you. at your That's office. Great. Uh, thank you for staying with us. These are people that are watching us. Uh, no one of you are, are very interested in the topic, and we hope we keep it going. But thanks again. Thanks.